Okay, so today's video will be on the topic of speciation. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, before we talk about speciation, we need to declare what is a species. Well, generally you'll see a definition like this. It's a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So here's a question. Can a human and a horse produce a hybrid? Well, I hope you know the answer to that question is no. We're different species. But the reason we're not able to produce a hybrid is because the DNA of a human is just too different from the DNA of a horse. And so if organisms can produce fertile offspring, then they we call them the same species. Now here's a man and woman. Why can two humans produce children? Yes, we are members of the same species, but there's a better answer to that. It's because the DNA of two humans is remarkably similar to one another. In fact, it's estimated that the DNA of every human on this earth is about 99.9% .9 identical. Because of this reason, a man and a woman can produce children because they are members of the same species and their DNA is so similar to one another. So if organisms cannot produce fertile offspring, then, th we, then they are members of different species. You know, can a human produce a hybrid with any of these other animals that you see? A chimpanzee, a gorilla, and an orangutan? And the answer is no, because the chimpanzee's DNA is about 1.2% different from humans, the gorilla about 1.6% different from humans, and the orangutan about 3.1% different. So you can see it doesn't take much of a difference to prevent organisms from reproducing. Just a fraction of a percent and members of, of groups of animals or plants are no longer able to reproduce. And so, you know, can a cat and a dog produce a hybrid? Well, I hope you know the answer to that is no, they're different species. But again, a, a better reason why they cannot produce a hybrid is because the DNA of a cat is just too different from that of a dog. Well, how about a chimpanzee and orangutan? Can they produce a hybrid? And again, the answer is no, they're, they're different species. But again, the DNA of a chimpanzee is just too different from the DNA of an orangutan. Well, here's an interesting example you might be familiar with. You know, a horse and a donkey can actually produce a hybrid called a mule. Are donkeys and horses members of the same species? It would be reasonable to say yes, but actually they're not. Remember the definition of a species. It's not just whether or not two individuals can make a baby with one another. But can the offspring then reproduce itself with other members? And so what we notice about mules is they're sterile. They're not able to reproduce. A male mule, a female mule cannot reproduce with one another. And for this reason, horses and donkeys are members of different species. So here's another similar example to what we just saw. A liger is a hybrid of a lion and a tiger. So are lions and tigers members of the same species? It'd be understandable if you said yes, but they're not. Again, the definition of a species is not just that they can produce an offspring, but they can produce fertile offspring. And since ligers are sterile, they're not able to make more baby ligers. A male liger, a female liger cannot breed with one another. So therefore, lions and tigers are different species because they can't successfully create individuals that can carry on uh, uh, down the generations. And so now that we understand what a species is, a group of organisms that can produce fertile offspring, we can talk about speciation. And this is the evolution of a new species. And throughout this video, we're going to talk about several factors that lead to speciation. One of those factors being natural selection. So here we have some squirrels and they happen to live in an area where eagles are preying on them. And so survival of the fittest, in this case the brown squirrels uh, survived better than the orange ones. A second fl a factor is something called gene flow. You know, gene flow can be kind of just looked at as migration. Here we have a river separating two populations of squirrels. But if one of the squirrels is able to swim across the river and uh, 
encounter the population on the other side and then breed, well, this new squirrel has brought genes from one area to the next. And this is something called gene flow, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Uh, DNA mutations. So, you know, every time organisms reproduce and cells multiply, there is the potential for error. Now, what if the squirrel has a, a random DNA mutation that resulted in its smaller than normal growth? Could this actually, uh, this smaller size actually be an advantage? And, and the answer is yes. Maybe because it's smaller than the others, it can hide better amongst the rocks and avoid those eagles that we saw a moment ago. If it's not as large, it doesn't need as much food, and so therefore it's less likely to starve. So these are all hypotheticals, but I hope you see the point that not every DNA mutation you know, is a fatal error. Another factor, a big factor in speciation, is something called reproductive isolation. Notice how these two populations of squirrels are isolated from one another by the river. This is going to be a key factor in the process of speciation. We'll go into this in more detail in a little bit. And lastly, something called genetic drift. You know, survival of not necessarily the fittest in this case. Sometimes it's good luck or bad luck depending on what side you're on. Let's say a storm is, ta uh, is happening and here we have a lightning strike causes a fire. And as the fire is spreading, of course, the squirrels are trying to flee, but they're just unable to. Did their adaptations that they acquired from natural selection allow them to survive? And look at the squirrels on the left of the river. Did they survive because of their adaptations from natural selection? No, they survived because they were in the right place at the right time. So we'll talk more about genetic drift in a little bit. So let's review a little more about natural selection. You know, this is a process where organisms with favorable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. And if we use our peppered moths as reference, you know, we talked more about the peppered moths in, in previous uh, sections. You know, right now, the light colored peppered moths have a survival advantage because they blend in better to the trees. And that's why there's, they're more common right now in this situation. So the environment, will select individuals that are more fit. In this case, the light-colored peppered moths are more fit than the dark-colored peppered moths. And so over time, the majority of the population, the majority of the group will be, the, will be made up of members with the advantage. So the majority of the peppered moths had the light coloration to them. Uh, the rare minority were the dark-colored peppered moths. But that began to change. Uh, if you recall, over the years, the trees began to darken. And as the trees began to darken, notice how the advantage is now shifting to the darker moths because there's birds in the area. And those birds are going to continuously look for food. And now the light colored ones are really standing out. And as time goes by, the white colored moths are picked off and, and eaten. And over time, the dark colored, better, uh, dark colored moths better survive and reproduce. And of course, the, the birds are still hunting, the dark moths are still reproducing. And so this is natural selection. Those that have an advantage in their environment are better likely to survive and reproduce. Okay, so the next topic I want to discuss are uh, DNA mutations, you know, random changes in our DNA. Here we have the red arrow pointing out a mutation. We have a G for guanine bonded with the A for adenine. You know, that's an error right there. Adenine is supposed, A is supposed to bond with T, C is supposed to bond with G. So this little mistake, this mutation can actually cause some change. And let's go into this in more detail. And so first of all, DNA mutations commonly happen whenever DNA is replicated. Now the act called DNA replication. Well, here's a cell with a piece of DNA in it. A's bonded to T's, C's bonded to G's. And so notice how when DNA is replicated, I've highlighted in red some errors. Sometimes this happens. Now normally there are spell checker enzymes that will fix these errors. But what if they're not fixed? What if these mutations are not repaired? Well, the cell will continue to divide in half by mitosis, let's say, and, and notice how we have a normal cell on top and a mutated cell on the bottom. Well, the mutated cell continues to multiply. And, you know, let's go over a, an example of, you know, what might happen 
as a result of a DNA mutation like this. And so one of the key factors in the process of speciation is mutation because mutation changes up the DNA in an organism. And if the DNA in uh, you know, one group of organisms is not compatible with another group, then they are members of the same species. So we have to look at mutation as a way to change up DNA. And so, well, let's go over some three, go over this three possible results of a DNA mutation using these, uh, these butterflies here. And so sometimes a mutation has no effect. The fitness of the offspring is not affected. These are called silent mutations. So for instance, let's say the father butterfly passes on normal DNA and the female passes on a mutation, and, uh, but the offspring has no, nothing noticeably wrong with it. And so even though this offspring inherited a mutation, its, uh, its fitness is unaffected. This is what we would call a silent mutation. Sometimes mutations can be harmful in that they reduce the fitness of an organism. Let's say that the male passes on normal DNA and through reproduction the female passes on a mutation to the offspring. And because of the mutation, let's pretend that this butterfly has a misshapen wing. Well, this would be harmful to its fitness. It's not going to be able to fly very well. It's going to be a, an easier prey for you know birds and lizards and, and other things that would want to eat it. Another topic I want to go into is gene flow. The movement of genes from one population to another. Here we have two populations of squirrels. The squirrels on top mainly living and reproducing with those on top. The squirrels on the bottom mainly living and reproducing with those on the bottom. But, see there's a gap in the little mountainous uh, terrain in the middle and, and every now and then you might have a squirrel from the bottom population migrate to the top and one from the top population migrate to the bottom. And this is what we call gene flow. Even though, even though most of the squirrels on top reproduce with others on top and most of the squirrels on the bottom reproduce with ones on the bottom, if there's a little bit of gene flow like this between two populations, well this is what will keep the population similar enough in their DNA that they can keep breeding generation after generation after generation and they would likely stay one single species. However, watch this. If gene flow between the two populations were to end, let's say that there was a rock slide and an earthquake happens and a rock slide closes that little gap. Well, now the two populations are cut off from one another. Now they're still members of the same species at this time, but over the years, we would think that the stopping of gene flow is a key factor in the evolution of a new species, what we would call speciation, because if there's no DNA mixing between the top squirrels and the bottom squirrels, eventually the DNA of the group on top becomes different, the DNA of the group on the bottom becomes different. And let's go over how that happens right now. So let's talk about reproductive isolation. In that previous slide, those squirrels were reproductively isolated. And that is when members of a population can no longer reproduce. And so what we're going to talk about is how we think that this is a key factor in speciation. Now remember, how will we know when a new species has actually developed? Well, the answer is when members can no longer produce fertile offspring. We apply the definition of what a species is. So here's our squirrels again. We just saw them a moment ago. Right now, these squirrels are what we would call geographically isolated. It's one type of reproductive isolation. In this example, reproduction is prevented by a geographic barrier. And so the members of group A, can, uh, the members on top, the squirrels on top, can only reproduce with other squirrels in their environment. The squirrels on the bottom can only reproduce with others in their environment. And over time, now that there's no gene flow, because because prior to the rock slide, there was gene flow between the two populations. But now, each population, the population on top, is subjected to different natural selection pressures. The population on the bottom is subjected to different natural selection pre uh, pressures. For instance, on top, pretend that the main predators in this environment are snakes. 
but in the bottom, pretend the main predators in this environment are owls. And so different predators will pick up on different uh, weaknesses in the squirrels. And let's pretend in the bottom population, uh, the climate is different. Let's say it's more of a uh, snowy environment. And so now we can see how natural selection will begin to change the squirrels on top from the squirrels on the bottom. Over time, perhaps, the, the browner ones begin to survive better through the process of natural selection. Well, uh, in the bottom squirrels, maybe the redder looking squirrels begin to uh, reproduce better and survive better. And, you know, in this environment, this is the advantage. And as time passes, since there's no gene flow between the top and the bottom, every time they reproduce with one another, there's going to be changes in their DNA because of mutations, which we talked about earlier. Because of crossing over, which is an act that happens in meiosis, where DNA gets reshuffled. Over millions and millions of years, these two squirrel populations would likely diverge and become different species. The squirrels on top having incompatible DNA with the squirrels on the bottom. And this is one of the key factors that leads to, again, the evolution of a new species. You know, in this world map right here, we brought up the lion and the tiger earlier. Notice how lions and tigers are geographically, today I should say, today they are geographically isolated from one another. And so the longer lions and tigers remain isolated from one another, the more different the DNA of each species will become. And, and we would predict that, you know, as time passes, eventually lions and tigers probably will not be able to produce a liger. Now again, we don't know, you know, if that's going to be in 10,000 years or a million years or however long it's going to be. But the longer lions and tigers are isolated from one another, then uh, the more different their DNA will become over, over, the, over the years. But what if, what if this case happened? What if a mutation uh, actually provided a benefit to the offspring? Let's say the male passes on normal DNA and let's say the female passes on a mutation. So the offspring has inherited a mutation. And what if this happens? What if it causes a slight color change? You know, this, number one, it could be harmful in that maybe the color uh, hurt it in its environment. But let's pretend that in this particular environment, this coloration allows it to blend better. And so here we have an example where maybe, just maybe, a mutation can actually increase the fitness of, the, of this particular insect, this particular uh, butterfly, and now it's able to reproduce and pass this mutation on. This is a way where a mutation can be passed on and other members of the population would inherit this. And over time, more and more and more individuals would inherit this DNA and this little change right here can spread. And we'll uh, touch on, you know, how this leads to, again, a new species in, in a little bit. Well, another type of reproductive isolation is what we call behavioral isolation. Let's look at the, the frogs in this pond. This is an example of where reproduction is prevented because maybe the members of this population have a different mating ritual. Their behavior is different. And so are uh, these frogs live in the same pond? Are they geographically isolated from one another? No, they, they encounter one another on a daily basis. But let's pretend when they are reproducing, these frogs right here have a high-pitched croak to them. Their, uh, their, their mating call has a higher pitch that the other ones just don't respond to. And let's pretend the other ones have a lower pitch croak or a mating call, and the ones uh, with a high pitch don't respond to them. And so due to their mating calls, the two groups are really isolated from one another. They might as well live on opposite ends of the world because there's no gene flow between the high-pitched croaking frogs and the low-pitched cro croaking frogs. And so as they reproduce with one another, the high-pitched frogs reproducing with other high-pitched frogs, changes in DNA will occur every time they reproduce, every time uh, crossing over happens, which is a part of meiosis. This will recombine the DNA of the individuals. And same in the other group of frogs, the low-pitched uh, frogs. 
changes in DNA will occur because of crossing over and mutations every time they reproduce with one another. And as time passes, the DNA of the group would become so different that even if they were to try to reproduce with one another, they probably wouldn't become, uh, they wouldn't be successful, and we would say that they have evolved into two new species. You know, here's kind of a, a fun li little example of organisms that have, you know, uh, unusual mating rituals. If you've ever seen the male peacock, when they are trying to uh, obtain the attention of the female peahen, the peacock will spread its tail feathers really uh, wide open and, and they're just colored gorgeously. And then they kind of do this, this little feather dance where they're trying to get the attention of the peahen in order to reproduce. And by the way, peacocks and peahens, these aren't the only organisms that have mating rituals. You know, if we think of uh, having a little fun with this, you know, mating rituals that human have, humans have, you know, we flirt with one another. You know, sometimes uh, cosmetics by both genders are worn to maybe enhance certain features. And let's not forget, you know, gift offerings, uh, you know, by both genders as well, gift offerings to the object of our affection. And, you know, dancing is a, is a form of uh, mating ritual in that it you know, is thought to maybe show virility, perhaps. And, and then let's not forget just uh, the displays of oneself that both genders are guilty of from time to time. You know, all this is done to, uh, to potentially attract a mate. And so humans, we have our mating rituals as well. So let's move on to another type of reproductive isolation, the third temporal isolation. And this is reproduction that is prevented by, you know, reproducing at different times of the year. You know, some animals have mating seasons. You know, here we have the same hillside. Just the hillside on top is it, and the hillside on the bottom are at different times of the year. And here we have a population of skunks. And so in this area are skunks, but they Let's say they reproduce at different times of the year. For instance, the skunks on top will reproduce in the spring, and the, every time they reproduce with others in the springtime, you know, changes will happen in their DNA because of crossing over and because of mutations. And the skunks in the bottom will reproduce in the winter, perhaps. And every time they reproduce with others in the winter, every time they reproduce, there'll be changes in DNA crossing over mutations will mix up the DNA of the population. So there's no gene flow between the two groups of skunks. Even though they live in the same hill, hillside environment, there's just no gene flow because they're just not reproducing with one another. So as time passes, the DNA of the skunks that reproduce in the spring becomes uh, too different from the skunks that reproduce in the winter. And even if they were to try to reproduce, their DNA has become incompatible, we would say they are no longer members of the same species. So moving on to our final topic, genetic drift. You know, this is where changes might happen in the gene pool due to chance and not necessarily due to natural selection. You know, the gene pool, picture, you know, 50 animals that live in a forest. Well, the gene pool would be all the genes that those 50 animals possess. And so changes can occur sometimes as a result of, of basically luck. And so genetic drift is likely, or is, I should say, is more likely in smaller populations. This is not generally something that we see in, you know, worldwide events. But it's also typically triggered by, let's say, something like a natural disaster. You know, here we have a forest fire. Or perhaps a natural disaster such as, you know, a hurricane or a mudslide can end up, uh, you know, tr uh, causing a lot of damage and killing a lot of life and, and perhaps leading to something called genetic drift, or contributing to genetic drift, and maybe perhaps even tornadoes. So let's go over an example of genetic drift. So in this case, pre-mudslide, here we have some beetles or some insects and, and they're living in this green foresty environment or grassy environment. And notice because the environment is green, the insects that have the green coloration on their shells are better adapted. That is because of natural selection. Natural selection right now is favoring the green insects because they are better able to hide and blend in. But let's say a mudslide were to happen. 
Look at who survives post mudslide. Notice the survivors, it had nothing to do with their coloration of red versus green. They were in the right place at the right time. Survival of maybe the luckiest, not necessarily the fittest. And so this would be an example of genetic drift. Now, when the survivors reproduce, the, the gene for red, red shells, is now more likely to proliferate and spread throughout, it, throughout the remainder of the population. And so genetic drift is a way that can change up the DNA just a little bit. Now, when you add genetic drift to natural selection to the various types of, of reproductive isolation that we talked about, these are all key factors that we think that contribute to the evolution of a new species. And so there you have it. If you're in my biology class, pause the video and bring me your answers before school or after school one day. I'd like to check them for accuracy. Thanks for watching.